first of all, everybody, welcome uh, to just talk about the mobile testing pyramid and especially on how to create a winning mobile testing strategy. Before we dive into that, I first want to look into the agenda about what I want to cover today. Um, so let's first take a look at this. First of all, I want to explain a little bit about myself. Uh, who is Wim? What do I do at SAUCE? Um, then I want to look into the questions that I get from uh, most of our customers about mobile, what they need to do. Um, then I want to dive a little bit more into the software development lifecycle for web applications and for mobile applications. And last but not least, I want to look into the mobile testing pyramid and then especially version 2.0. And hopefully every step that we are walking through would kind of like give you an idea about how that mobile testing pyramid version 2.0 would look like. Um, but like I mentioned, everybody's here just to know who I am. No, just kidding. Um, my name is Wim Sellers. I'm a lead solutions architect at SaaS Labs. Already worked there since 2018. Based in the Netherlands at the moment, uh, visiting at our office uh, in Berlin. But normally I do my work also from uh, my hometown in uh, De Ronten. Uh, if you want to look up for it, really nice place uh, in the center of the Netherlands. Um, I started testing as a QA consultant in 2007 and learned a lot more about the technique behind it. And then I thought that automating the stuff that I was doing was more uh, challenging for me, at least, than only doing the manual testing. So that was also the time that I was looking into the open source world. I learned a lot from the open source community, not only coding, but also the knowledge. A lot of open source people uh, uh, share knowledge. It's not only contributing to or Appium or to Selenium or to WebDriver Yo, or Nightwatch, all those projects. No, it's also sharing the knowledge. And that was also the thing that I started doing started to share knowledge and knowledge. And that's also how SAS Labs and I got connected. I love to work with mobile. Um, as I mentioned, open source, I'm even an open source con uh, contributor for multiple open source projects. And I really love JavaScript. You, so you can find also some open source packages uh, out there that could help you with your testing. Um, if you want to know more about me, if you want to about, for example, what I do, during the day, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on GitHub, uh, or you can connect with me also on LinkedIn. But before we go further, I also want to share kind of like a fun fact about myself, because every time that I'm giving a presentation, I want to share something extra about me that you really know who I am. And the thing that I wanted to share with you today is that I have a lot of opinions. And hopefully today I can kind of like give you a good balance between the opinions that I have, the knowledge and the experience that I had in the last uh, years. And I also uh, hope, hopefully I can share a lot of facts with you. But let's first start with one of the opinions, one of the things that I get asked a lot, and especially when I'm talking about mobile and then also about a mobile automation strategy. And that is the following. Is it real devices or is it emulator simulators? What do we need to use? And it's not only this question. Sometimes I get this specific question versus real devices versus emulators, simulators. And when we're talking about versus, there's something that I have against it. It feels like, for example, this, where we're talking about the movie Civil War where we're talking about Captain America and Iron Man. And we all know when we're talking about the Versus story that Iron Man is way cooler with all his techniques in comparison to Captain America. Or when we look at this movie where it's King Kong versus Godzilla, it's obvious that King Kong is kind of like the best because yeah, personally, I love gorillas and yeah, I also love monkeys. So for me, King Kong is the guy. And if again, if we're talking about Versus, we can talk about cars like the most, well, it's the smart. The smart will win when we have that versus story because he's just being smarter. Um, but let's get back to the versus story when we talk about automation and when we also talk about mobile versus real devices versus emulators and simulators. I really enjoyed this talk. This was a talk between Angie and Colby about Selenium versus Cypress. But again, there was something in my in me saying like versus versus, is it really versus? And when you look on the internet and you would do some research, you would find more like Selenium versus 
Cyprus the rematch, uh, Selenium versus Cyprus a feature comparison based. And in my opinion, there is no versus story. When we talk about these tools, we need to think about a different persona. Not everyone is going to use Cypress or not everyone is going to use uh, Selenium. There are different personas behind that. And also what we need to be aware of is that they also can complement each other. So if we now go back to that initial question that I got from a lot of customers, is it real devices versus emulators and simulators? I do not think that it's this. I think it's this. I think it's real devices and emulators. And like I mentioned, they need to complement each other. And I will try to explain that. And I'd love to kind of like also share that with another opinion. I love pyramids. Sometimes I love them. Yeah, I, I love pyramids. And we all know this pyramid. We all know the testing pyramid where we have multiple layers, where we have your unit test layer, where you have your integration test cases, where you have your end-to-end -end test cases, and every layer has its own responsibility. And when we go higher in that pyramid, hopefully we would use less test cases from the previous layer. Every time we would execute a new test case, or at least not the bunch that we executed in the previous layer. And if we then look at mobile testing, then nine of 10 times mobile testing takes part in that end-to-end -end test layer where we need to have the physical mobile devices or we need to have an emulator and a simulator. And a few years ago, a good friend of mine, Ko Ding, came up with the mobile testing pyramid. And there's a YouTube link we will also share with you later on with the original talk about the mobile testing pyramid. But the basics of the mobile testing pyramid is that it can be divided into multiple layers. And you would now might wonder, okay, desktop browsers, mobile devices, mobile apps, uh, how should I see that one? Well, if we're talking about the layer desktop browsers, then that's the layer when we're talking about, for example, mobile web applications, or if you're developer or need to test a hybrid application, the hybrid part of that application. And it's something we will get back to. Then in that layer, you would do some automated testing, manual testing, and you would use mobile simulation. And what I mean with that is something that I will also show in a few slides. You would also have high velocity there. And then if you would go to the next layer, then you would see for emulators and simulators, it's a little bit closer to what the mobile experience would be. And it would also give you the option with high scalability that you can run multiple test cases at the same time. And then last but not least, also kind of like the points from that mobile testing pyramid is that it's more focused on the end user testing, also the non-functional requirements when we talk about real devices and also about usability testing. And this mobile testing pyramid can be seen as a guideline, a guideline for your mobile automation strategy. And this strategy is really, really important, maybe even more important in comparison to websites. So before I dive into detail for every layer of the mobile testing pyramid, I first love to look into the software development lifecycle. And in that software development lifecycle, I would love to compare web applications with mobile applications. And the reason for that is that there is a difference. And I think that a lot of people that now joined this webinar um, also have the experience with web applications. And maybe not everybody has the experience with releasing mobile applications to production. So I want to use basically that software development lifecycle and walk through every step. Well. Like I mentioned, maybe, well, hopefully everybody already know kind of like what the web applications are. It's basically just a website that's scalable. You can run it on your desktop browser. You can run it on an iPad or a, an Android tablet, or you can run it on your phone. And the advantage of this is, is that you would have the same source. The source lives in the cloud and nine of 10 times can easily be deployed. It doesn't matter if you're using an iPhone or if you're using Firefox, the experience should be the same because you're uh, deploying the same source to production. But when we're talking about mobile applications, when we're talking about hybrid or native applications, then we're talking about the applications that are being deployed to, or the Apple store are being deployed to the Google Play Store. So there is a difference, like I mentioned, and why? Well, let's 
take a look at this software development lifecycle where we have the planning, we've got building, we've got testing, deploying, and especially for those mobile applications from deploying, you will push them to the stores and then hopefully in production, you would get some feedback. If we wanna know kind of like the difference between web and mobile, let's use the following table where we're going to compare the, the phases here for web, what will happen for ha web and what will happen for hybrid and native applications. So let's start with uh, the following. Let's start with the planning and the coding phase. First of all, when we're talking about the planning and the coding phase, I don't think that there's a real difference. And especially if we have almost the same complexity for web and for hybrid slash native applications. But when we look at the building phase, then you would see that building a web application is it's pretty, pretty fast, if I may say so. Within, what is it, two or three minutes, you should be able to build your web application and maybe even deploy it later on to a specific environment. But if you would compare that with hybrid slash native applications, you would see that it's medium to slow. And that's mainly influenced, especially if you need to build an iOS application, uh, it can take up between five and 50 minutes, depending on the machine and the environment that you're using. Building the application, getting a release of your application just takes time. If we then look at the testing phase, and then I mean, especially also the automated part, then testing for web can be pretty fast. And especially if you can scale this, in a cloud, for example, like with SaaS Labs, you can run it on multiple browsers, parallelize it, you can get really fast feedback. But when we're talking about running something on a device, then we need to be aware of the fact that this could be two to six times slower. So this could already be a bottleneck if you want to run the exact same test cases that you have for web. If you want to run the exact same test cases on a hybrid or a native application, it will be slower. It will be slower. Okay, let's go to the next phase, like deploy. We, we've all seen it in the news, like Amazon can deploy, what is it, once every minute or maybe even per second. And this is also something that we see that more and more companies want to deploy to production, uh, uh, not, not per month, but maybe per week or even per day, per hour, or even, like I mentioned, the AWS uh, or the Amazon uh, 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 story, where they're going to deploy per minute. If you would then compare that with a hybrid or a native application that you would provide to the app stores, then you would see the following. You first have a review time. Apple and Google will review your application. Is it well enough for basically, do you fit all also uh, um, the limit, uh, how do you say it? Uh, do, do you uh, look into the rules and regulations that they have? They will test your application and this can take up to one to seven days. Seven days is the fact that you're really unlucky because you will get a really extensive re review by uh, Google or Apple, but there is a longer time just to get the review. And when you have the review, it's not in production immediately. It basically needs to be uploaded and this could take between, well, up to 24 hours to get your application out there in the stores and also your customers to be notified that there, for example, is an update, yes or no. And then last but not least, if we dive a little bit more into operation and feedback, if there is something happening in production, for web, it's pretty easy to debug this. And again, if you would use something like SAS, um, you could spin up whatever VM you want. You can spin up a, a Mac with Safari and just figure out what is happening for your customers. But it's not that easy for mobile devices. It's hard without the proper tools. And then if we look at that, we need to think about the fact that the time to market, especially with quality, is really, really important here. So if we look at mobile devices, and especially the, the mobile applications, then we also have some issues and some challenges here. First of all, if you would compare web with mobile, with web, you can easily roll back something. So if you introduce the bug in production, you can just roll it back. It's also something that happens with, yeah, with sauce apps. Sometimes we also have a bug. We need to roll this back. But if you do this with your mobile application, you have a challenge. You cannot roll something back, which is already installed on the phone of your users. You do not have that power to do that. The only thing that you could do is think about a very smart system where that system would basically block the usage if there's really a blocking error and that people need to update uh, that version. But you cannot roll it back. 
And what we also see is for mobile that it's remote by default. So if there's something happening, it's always happening somewhere else in the hand of your end user. And do you happen to know which specific device they have? Do you happen to know how many apps are open? Do you happen to know what their memory consumption is of your application or the application uh, uh, that's basically a third application or something that's running in the background? Normally, you do not have that information. And then last but not least, what we also have is that we have a very fragmented market. If you look at, for example, Apple, we would have around 28 different devices. That's, that's manageable. All the devices that uh, Apple released, around 28 different devices. But take a look at Android. The amount of different devices you have there, OS versions, uh, brands, uh, uh, models, it, it's, it's crazy. So how do you make sure that you get the right feedback there? And how do you make sure that you're going to test this? Let's get back. Let's get back to that software development lifecycle because now we already touched three bottlenecks. The first bottleneck is the testing phase. The second bottleneck is also deploying. We need to be aware that if we're going to deploy something to production, that we try to cover as much as possible because going to production with an issue in your mobile application that is going to be released and then you need to wait for the review and also for the release it's going to cost you precious time. And time, especially for you, might mean losing money. And that's not what you want. And then last but not least, that bottleneck for mobile applications is being able to debug this. And something that came back basically in all three phases is this, debugging. Being able to debug something in all the phases of your software development lifecycle. So what you basically want to do is you want to release to production with confidence. And to do this, you need to trust yourself. You need to make sure that you have the right quality and the right debugging options. And this is why I think that mobile testing pyramid is really important. So let's get back to this one. Let's get back to the mobile test, especially all the layers. What we're going to do now is we're going to start with the desktop layer. And the desktop layer, yes, this is the layer that you can only use when you're developing a web application, also for mobile and also a hybrid application. We're going to look into that and then going to look what are the responsibilities of that layer. First of all, when we're talking about desktop browsers, there is a simulation option. You have the possibility to simulate that you're using a mobile phone. So we're thinking about this in the back of our mind and also when we're going to do the automation, think and use that. The first advantage that you would have with testing specific things on the web browsers is that it has fast execution. In a matter of seconds, you can just launch your browser and if you want, you can even just test it headless. Then the second thing is that even if you would use your local machine, you can just spin up 10 browsers at the same time. Downside is you cannot use your machine. And then again, Sauce Labs would be a very ideal partner for you where you can just run it unattended and you can just work on your machine and wait for the results. And then last but not least, what you also can do there is basically run it cross-platform by using Chrome or by using Safari and then resize the browsers and use the mobile emulation. But there are also some downsides. First of all, it's still a desktop browser. So rendering is different. So be aware of the fact that you cannot do any visual checks there. Then also what we need to be aware of is that we do not have any native integrations. So no keyboards, no native modules from the OS itself, nothing of that. You would only have that mobile uh, emulated browser. And then last but not least, yeah, it is basically just not a device. So it will tell something for you. It will give you kind of like an idea, but it's not what in the end your end user will have. So if we would then look at this, what could we test? What should we focus on? Well, first of all, again, if we're talking about a web application, you should think about all the types of testing, your basic flow system testing, try to test really small parts of your application. Those are the things that you can already do. What you can also do is, like I mentioned, do the cross-browser part where you could use the equivalent desktop browsers and resize it with the emulation mode. You can already look into, for example, responsive design. I'm not talking about visuals, but I'm more talking about if you would have three components next to each other on a desktop browser, if you would resize that. And normally in a mobile view, you would have those three components below each other. Is that really happening? And with the new Selenium 4 feature, you can now easily validate that. 
But just to give you an example, and hopefully you could see this moving, this is what booking.com is doing. Here you would see if you would resize it, everything changes. But if you're using, for example, Safari, you can easily change the user agent. You would see that now also the styling has changed. And if we would scroll down, we would also see, for example, that there is now a notification that you can download the app. That one will not be shown if we disable it. If we go back to the default, we need to wait again. If we scroll down now, we will not have that notification. So those are things that you could already, already validate just in the browser. You don't need to have a mobile device or you don't need to have an emulator or a simulator for that to validate that. So that's already something that you could do in this phase when we're talking about, for example, web applications. And then last but not least, some overall visual layout. It is not, again, checking everything pixel perfect, but it will give you an ID. We need to be aware of the fact that rendering, again, could be different on your uh, um, desktop browser in comparison to, uh, for example, a emulator simulator or even a real device. And especially with Chrome, you might have kind of like confidence enough that it will look the same, but I will also show you a few examples where it will not look the same. Let's take a look at that. What you would see here are basically just a few native web components. And with native web components, I mean an input, a button, basically all types of native components that you could create on a web page. On the left, you would see the Chrome browser. In the middle, you would see Safari. On the right, you would have an ID how it will look and feel like on an iOS simulator. So there's there's no, it's not a big difference here. But if you would zoom in a little bit more, you would see, for example, that the code, the, the color field on iOS uh, uh, is completely different. It's rendering different in comparison to what you would have on your Chrome browser or on your uh, uh, Safari browser. But what if we would open also some native components? If we would now focus, for example, on the input field, you would already see here on that input field that there is a keyboard opened, which could basically interrupt the view of your customer. And you will not have that on your emulated browser. Or if you would open, for example, the, the color picker, it's completely different if you would compare this with a mobile uh, uh, device or an emulator and a simulator, it would trigger native components. So uh, this is the reason why I think you should not do those real visual checks. And maybe also the reason why you should validate certain things because the flow for a customer could differ when we are talking to native components. And this is basically also something that you want to validate for your customers with, for example, the date picker, which could look different, again, with a native component, or, for example, with a select box. As you can see, very small here, a little bit smaller uh, or a little bit bigger for the Safari browser, and completely different in the way to interact with it when we're talking about an iOS simulator. So be aware of the fact that if we're going to do some testing on desktop browsers, be aware of the fact that there could be some functional differences in the flow. So if we would now take a look at emulators and simulators, then the advantage of an emulator and a simulator, if you would have, for example, a Mac, is that it's easy to set up. You can easily install everything on your Mac. You can run Android. You can run iOS. If you only have a Windows machine, you can run at least Android on your machine. But you have the possibility to already play with it yourself. It's easy. It's free. Also, if you would then look into it, it's also scalable, but it consumes a lot of your system power. So running this in the cloud makes it easier also for you to scale and get that fast feedback. And then last but not least, this is the first phase where you would already have that native API integration, where you could test the impact of the keyboard of your application, uh, where you could also test, for example, biometrics. A lot of people don't know, but you can already use biometrics with simulators, and you can even use biometrics or fingerprint with Android emulators. You can do testing with incoming calls for Android. There are more things. What we need to be aware of, especially for Android, is that there is no Samsung. Uh, versions, no Samsung emulator. There is no UOI. There is no Sonomi emulator. It's basically just stock Android. And then even in our list, we have a Samsung tab or we have a Samsung uh, S20 uh, device. The only difference is the screen size. It still is stock Android. So 
because there is no manual or there's no manufacturer uh, uh, skin, you might need to be aware of the fact that you cannot always check visuals there. What we also need to be aware of is that with emulators and simulators, you can hardly test real resource usage, especially not in an automated process. You can do that when you connect an emulator or a simulator to the specific IDE, Android Studio for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for Android and Xcode for uh, iOS, but that's a manual process. There is no process at the moment to do this automatically, or at least not an easy process. And yeah, you cannot test, for example, blue to the network conditions uh, camera with your emulators or simulators. So there are some downsides. So what should we focus on when we're talking about emulators and simulators? If we already used the desktop browsers, the emulated uh, desktop browsers, uh, then we're talking about that web application or hybrid application, then you can just focus on the flows, basically some happy flows or some error flows. But if we're now talking about the native part of your application, then because of the scalability, you could run your functional flow on those emulators and simulators. Basically just to click pass through your application based also on the business value. That's really important. Don't automate everything. Try to think about also the business value of the case that you're going to automate. Again, visuals, you could take a look at visuals. iOS simulators are more accurate and comparable to uh, iOS real devices, but like I already mentioned with Android, you might have a challenge there because there is no real skin from, for example, Samsung that could influence the output or in the visuals. Like I mentioned, also the native API integrations. And just to give you an example of that, this, if you want to test, for example, how your application behaves based on sending text messages, then I would always advise you to go to the documentation. In this case, I selected the Appium documentation. And if you would then zoom in, you would see that sending a text message is depending on the driver that we're going to use. And it's only supported on Android, not on iOS. But there is at least a possibility to test this. On the other hand, if you want to test this on both platforms, then you might want to use real devices and you might want to use real SIM cards in the devices. That's also something SOS can help you with. But having said that, let's go back also to this. Here we can test GPS. You see the location of my home. Now we're going to San Francisco. And now we're going to get an incoming call. I'm going to decline it. And I think, yeah, yeah, we get a text message here from, from quoting the original creator of the mobile uh, uh, testing pyramid. But basically, those are the things that you could do and see how your application is behaving under certain conditions, especially on those emulators and simulators. And then last but not least, and this is something that most people forget to test, are the touch interactions. And with touch interactions, I basically mean this, tabbing, double tapping, flicking, swiping, dragging, pinching, and zooming. These are things that are forgotten the most. It might be that it's it might be challenging to create actions, but this is how your end user is using your application. He or she is not using a mouse. No, they're using their fingers. Two fingers, three fingers, they're swiping from left to right. Make sure that this phase, when we're talking about emulators and simulators, that you're going to test those gestures in this phase. If you want to know more about this, I also gave a uh, webinar about this, about how to create certain gestures. We can also share that YouTube uh, link with you later. But it, this is really important to test gestures and then start testing this on emulators and on simulators. So now that we know what to test on those Android uh, emulators and iOS simulators, what should we do on the real devices? So again, what we could do here is look into what will happen with your application on the real conditions. And also the advantage that you would have in some cases, emulators and simulators might even be a little bit slower than real devices. Spin up time on, uh, of a real device might be faster even than the spin up time of an emulator or a simulator. And yeah, in the end, it's basically just a real thing. That's kind of like the advantage of testing it on a real device. This is also what we hear a lot from our customers. But what we also need to be aware of is that if you want to test on real devices, and especially if you have real devices in a device card, for example, uh, at your office, it comes with a price. You need to buy all those devices. And for example, also, you might have some challenges with procurement within your company. They're asking like, you need a new device again. 
And if you would think about this, then also a, a cloud solution would be really easy for you. If you would just have the option to use it, then you would have the option to select different devices, different OS models, making it much easier also for you. And last but not least, if we're talking about those native applications or hybrid applications, be aware of the fact that if we're talking about iOS, that we need to have specific builds, that we need to have specific certificates. Developers might be able to help you with that, but that might be kind of like a downside if you want to test uh, the applications, especially on real devices for iOS. So what should you focus on? We're not going to test everything that we already tested on the emulators and the simulators. No, we're now going to focus more on usability, validating the usability. For example, click areas. Have you ever thought about this? If you use your finger, I, I normally call that the fat finger test. Have you ever thought about your finger and compare that with, well, if I would compare that with my father, his finger is almost twice as, not twice as big, but it's, it's a little bit bigger than my finger. If he touches the screen, he always presses the wrong button. Have you ever thought about that? Those are things that you might also be able to focus on in your test cases. And again, those touch actions uh, are really, really nice to already val also validate in this part. He would also have the option to test specific browsers, to test, for example, Chrome on, on iOS or Firefox on uh, uh, a uh, Android device. Be aware of the fact that this nine of 10 times need to be a manual task because Appium, if you're going to use Appium, does not support testing Chrome, for example, on iOS or Firefox. There is currently a beta driver out there to test Firefox on uh, uh, Android devices, but it's not as stable as the rest of the drivers that are out there. So be aware of that. And last but not least, I don't know if a lot of people know this, Apple basically shuts down the ability for all vendors to provide their own browser engine. So Chrome browser engines in the end on iOS are the same engines as Safari. The only difference is the skin and the ability to use your password manager and your bookmarks. That's the biggest advantage of Chrome on iOS. But having said that, let's go to the next one, what you could do. Here you're going to do the visuals and the visuals what you can already see here is you've got the real rendering, but you can also test the leftovers. Because again, you might not be able to test everything on the emulators or the simulators, then use your real devices to, to test the last parts. Because if you would test everything on that, it might even take longer. And again, you can test incoming calls. If you would have a SIM card, GPS, text messages, all kinds of things. But what is also important in this phase for real devices it is, you, is that you can now focus also on the error on hanging and crashes of your application. And I just want to give you a short demo and we will dive into this uh, a little bit more uh, in a, pre a presentation from Christian. But what you would see here is we selected an application, we opened the application, selected a product and our application crashed. And with real devices, you could now get more error reporting, more details about what was happening in your application. And like I mentioned, we're going to dive into this uh, a little bit more in our next presentation, but this could help you really debug what's happening, basically to the line of the code that is crashing, really helping your developers to fix this as soon as possible. And then last but not least, what's also really important here is performance. We can think about how our application, or we could look into how our application is performing on specific devices. I was in a conference a few weeks ago, the 2nd of uh, September, it was a React Native conference. And there, a lot of developers spoke about performance and especially that a company increased or decreased their, uh, uh, their load time of their application with 80% due to performance issues not specifically to uh, React Native, but some, with some database queries, but they only saw that in production with phones from customers that were not high-end phones. Those were the phones that the developers were using and not the phones that their end users were using. So performance is also really important here, especially on the real devices. And just to give you an example of this, again, Christian will also look into this a little bit more. We have our application, it crashed. If we would now go to also SAS Labs, we can also give you more information about the device vitals, about the CPU, what happened during that crash uh, with the memory or the UI responsiveness. Those are all things that could be given to you during testing, during manual testing, 
in that software development lifecycle, and especially on real devices. So if we now go back to our mobile testing pyramid, we basically covered the first part of that software development uh, lifecycle, especially that testing part. But if we would get back to our software development lifecycle, we also have that deploying part. The deploying part where we need to wait before we can release it to production or before it, really, it is released to production. And that time, that basically precious time can, how do you say? Yeah, just cost you money in the end. So there's a second phase that you could in, implement there between testing it and the deploying phase. And that is alpha and beta testing. And I don't know if you ever heard of those two terms, alpha and beta testing. And if not, let me just give you a few things about what it means. We already saw in the slides before alpha testing, where we're going to focus more on what the feature should do. It is done, being done by the team of experts, the developers, the testers. It's being done manual or automated. The downside only of that way of testing is that you would have a very, very narrow focus. And also due to the amount of time that you might have with your testing, you might even have a limited set of possible configurations. And then I'm not only talking about the device itself, but also the conditions in which it is being tested. When we're talking about beta testing, then we're talking about testing being done by real world users, where most of it will be done manually, where you could also validate certain flows, where you can validate the ideas that you have for certain features. And like I mentioned, really important in this phase is that you would have the real environmental conditions. With the alpha testing, you would have basically a very clean setup. But with the beta testing, you would have it on the phone of your end user, maybe with multiple apps on it, or maybe just on that phone that you never thought of, but might even influence how your customer is consuming your application. So what is really important here is with beta testing, we try to get the real world exposure and also the feedback, and especially in like the early stage of your application, and that will give you the information about what needs fixing or basically what needs ditching. Is that feature really that good? Or should we think about the flow of that feature? That's information that could get back from that beta testing experience. And then normally compare that with this meme. I think a lot of people know this one and ha or have seen this, where you would have basically the pavement, which is the design, uh, and you would have the user experience, where basically people walk through the grass because it's faster, it's easier to do. You can also compare alpha testing with beta testing, where alpha testing is basically just walking the path, but beta testing is basically just being done by your end users. They're not going to walk that path that you thought that they would walk. And when we're talking about that, we would also love to get some feedback. How do you get that feedback? Because there could be some bugs. And Normally, we do not get that feedback from our customers. So if we think about how can we, what are the reasons basically for not getting that feedback, then you would have reasons like this. This, for example, it's I'm too busy. I will not report it or it took too much time. Even when you do a beta testing phase internally in your own organization, you might have people that will not report a bug because previously when they did that, they needed to sit into 20 meetings and you know, the thing that people don't always like to do is sit in meetings. So if we're talking about those bugs, how do you want to get that information? Well, if you're going to do that, if you're going to implement that beta testing, then you need to make sure that it's easy, that it's not taking too much time, that you're not asking data of a customer that you already know, like for example, your device model, or maybe even the battery percentage that might have an impact on why the application uh, crashed. Just make sure that this is a very non-friction or zero friction and non-intrusive process for your end users or for the beta users that you're going to ask to test your application. So here's just a simple example of the beta testing. What I was doing here was just basically with one hand. Um, so imagine how fast this can be done if you're using two hands. I just needed to kind of like uh, 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 use of one hand for the camera. But here you, for example, for a beta testing feedback, you can sketch, you can say, okay, there is a lot of Dutch on this page, but my phone is in English. Why is it in Dutch? Just send this information. And then you might wonder, okay, what happens with the data? Well, 
you would get, for example, information like this. We are using our beta program. You can get the video, you can get the interaction, you can get more information like we've already shown you in the testing, but now from production with CPU, with memory, basically all the vitals that you need to have. And in the end, also an extra video from production, from the phone of your device, uh, from your customer, giving you the information about what he or she did before the bug appeared. So it's basically a short video getting you to that specific stage. And this will help you replicate also a bug that was happening on the phone of that end user, that specific phone. So now that we know that also beta testing can help you with that deploying phase, if we implement that properly, it could reduce basically the amount of releases that we need to do. And we all know releasing a new fix for a mobile application to the stores, yeah, it can take up between one and seven days. If we can reduce the amount of times that we do that with beta testing, we could in the end also release faster and maybe even more often. And then last but not least, and this is something that we already covered, if you have the right information from production with the right device model, maybe even with the exact line of code where that crash happened, it is so easy for the developers to fix this. So if we now know this and we go back also to that mobile testing pyramid, then we've basically seen the following. We've had our mobile use cases. And again, if you have a hybrid app or a web application, desktop browsers can be used and you can focus there on the high volume and also the responsive UI testing. Then on top of that, use your emulators and simulators. And then especially also for that functional testing, but also look into your UX, partially UI testing and also the usability testing. Also start testing some specific gestures there. See how your application is responding to it. And then for the real devices, we first have basically the UI across all the device models. Um, we can also focus there on validating specific features and usability testing, but we can also add that extra data there. And this is the new part in that uh, uh, mobile testing pyramid where you would have your end user devices. And we've added some arrows there because this part can be as big as you want if you, implement, if you add a lot of users or not but this could give you more confidence in releasing your application because you've got the feedback from production before you go to production. Yeah, that sounds strange, but it's still that. Here you would also see basically the stages. We start with the development and in the end we, start, we go to production. And also you would see here the personas that could be used in this mobile testing pyramid strategy, where, for example, the developers start, where the SDETs start, or extending it by teams with the beta testing program. This is basically mobile testing pyramid version two, where you add multiple personas, where you add basically also multiple end users of your application and getting that feedback in time before you deploy your new version to the stores. So hopefully, if I would now just summarize what we just discussed, you heard a lot of opinions, also experiences, and also some facts, and I hope that I had the right balance for you. And secondly, there is no or slash versus. I would always say that every layer of the mobile testing pyramid has its own responsibility. They complement each other. Try to divide and use the, the environment that might give you the fastest response. And then last but not least, hopefully I also gave you some new ideas and opportunities to think about releasing your application to production with confidence. Because I think that in the end, what we all want to do is we want to build that digital confidence together with you. Because as we always say, amazing experience can change the world and can change also how your end users are thinking about your application when it's in production. I realize that I've been talking almost for 45 minutes now, um, but Ashwini, I don't know if there are any questions at the moment that I could answer. Yes, Wim, you have a lot of questions, a lot of interest from our listeners. Uh, so I can read out some and you can you know, try to answer them live. So uh, do firmware testing on mobile devices. Uh, we do firmware testing on mobile devices. This is a question from Mukta. Does this tool allow firmware upgrades? Sorry, can you uh, repeat it again? So basically, Mukta is asking that they do firmware testing on mobile devices. So she wants to know, the, does SaaS Labs sort of allow firmware upgrades? Uh, firm, firmware uh, upgrades. 
Uh, and then especially the firmware upgrades from the devices? Yes, they are doing the firmware testing on mobile devices. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what they exactly mean with the firmware. If they mean kind of like the OS versions, like for example, beta versions uh, of OS versions, then yes, in our cloud, we also provide uh, the option for uh, our customers to test on beta versions. When a beta version is out there, we will also allow or release that in our public cloud with all the devices. And we also have a, a separate type of cloud. Some customers also have specific devices assigned to them. Those are uh, called the uh, uh, um, the private devices. And then customers can just uh, uh, assign specific devices to be updated. Like for example, a Pixel to get the latest version of Android or one of the latest uh, devices from iOS to get the latest beta on that. So hopefully that will answer the question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wim. Uh, there's one more question. Beside native application, how does a progressive web app behave differently in emulator versus simulator? Um, it's a good question. And um, for a web application, there's hardly any difference between an emulator uh, simulator. An emulator is basically for Android. A simulator is for iOS. Um, so the responsiveness and also look and feel on an emulator for a, uh, a, a browser test would not be a big difference. The only difference that I would focus on when we want to test, for example, a web application uh, is that you would do your gestures on the emulators and simulators. Because what I've seen in the past is that if scrolling doesn't work on a browser, people just inject a piece of JavaScript and then it will automatically uh, scroll. But I've never seen an end user injecting JavaScript. So you could go to production with a basically a bug in your application if they cannot use their fingers. So especially focus also on that when we're testing on uh, emulators or simulators. Yeah, and Avi has a question regarding crash analysis, specifically in iOS, the example you showed us uh, around backtrace, but iOS devices produces crash logs that are not available for extraction in source labs. So is there a plan to support it? That's a good question. I do not have an answer on that one, uh, but what we will do is we will get back to that uh, to that specific question later on. And we can probably take one more. Uh, Shanti has a question. Our app is hybrid app, only for login. Does Samsung internet browser work with APM automation on Android devices, or it should be Chrome browser as default? Will it differ with the real device and MU sim? Um, that's a good question. Um, by default, Appium does not support the Samsung browser. So by default, uh, it only gives full support for the Chrome browser, um, depending on how your flow works. Um, under the hood, if this is happening still in the hybrid application, it uses the system web view. Uh, uh, um, and that one is based on Chromium. And that one is basically the same as Chrome. So hopefully that already answers your uh, question, Shanti. Wonderful. Uh, we also have a question. Is there a tool that you re recommend for mobile automation testing? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. A lot of people <laughs> ask me for a silver bullet. And to be honest, I do not have a silver bullet. If I would have a silver bullet, then I might not even be working at SaaS, uh, uh, to be honest. No, just kidding. <laughs> I think if you would, if we go back to one of my first slides, I mentioned that there are some conversations about Cypress, for example, versus Selenium. And I also mentioned that um, they are meant for a different persona and that they can also complement with each other. So depending on what you need to test, Espresso, which is a native framework for Android, and, and XUI test, which is a native framework for uh, iOS, could be useful for you if you automate, if you need to automate a native application, but then you also need to have more of the developer skills. Appium might help you kind of like covering almost everything. So what I would advise you to do in this case is just to do a proof of concept with one, two or three tools, just to figure out if you have some requirements, validate those requirements and see if you can match them with uh, the application that you need to test. And that would hopefully give you an idea what you can or what you should use. Wonderful, we'll take one more last question that had already come in, uh, which asks is when we understand the value of having a, you know, for example, crash data from production, but why should I already start implementing and using this during manual and automated testing? 
Yeah, I think that that's a really good question. I think if we go back to that software development lifecycle slide, I think it's, uh, let me just get back to this slide. In this slide, you would see basically that the deploy phase, bringing something to production can take one to seven days. If you're able to detect certain crashes already in your testing or in your development phase, it will give you more information. And the sooner you can fix this, the less bugs you would have when you go to production. So implementing this already in your building slash testing phase before you go to the deployment of your application to the stores will give you good insights if your application is working yes or no, even in the background. So hopefully that also answers the question.